I have never shared this story with anyone outside my immediate family. It may sound insane, but I promise it's the absolute truth. When I was 15, my parents and I moved to a newly constructed housing development in Beltsville, Maryland. We lived right on the end of a cul-de-sac, but our house was the only one that was completed. Granted, our lawn was just one giant patch of dirt, but we didn't mind. We loved the experience of living in a brand new house in a quiet corner of the neighborhood. All of the other houses around us still needed the finishing touches put on, such as windows and siding, so none of them were occupied. During the day, there were contractors all over the other properties hard at work. But at night, it was nice and quiet, and my parents and I would take long walks around the area and sneak peeks at the inside of the other empty houses. About a week after we moved in, I woke up at around 2 a.m. from an awful pain on my foot that turned out to be an ingrowing toenail. But I didn't know that at the time. I limped downstairs trying to find my Game Boy because I figured if I was going to stay awake and miserable, I might as well play some Pokemon Blue. To make the time pass, I didn't turn on any lights on my way downstairs, and I found the Game Boy on the coffee table by the light of the street lamps outside. I walked back past the front door to head back upstairs, when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, and paused. Next to our front door, we had a long window that gave us a perfect view of our porch outside and the driveway beyond. My mom had intended to put up a curtain, but hadn't got around to it yet. I stopped in my tracks and turned to look outside, and after squinting for a few seconds, my heart began to hammer inside my chest, and I'm sure my eyes went as big as stop signs. In the dark, it was hard to tell for sure. The only light I had to judge by was the street lamp at the end of the driveway, but there looked to be a figure of a man standing with his back to me, literally just off our porch. As if he had just stepped off of it, he seemed to be staring in the direction of the empty house across the street. That was scary enough, but what terrified me even more was how dead still he was standing. He wasn't even shifting his weight or fidgeting in any way I could make out. I blinked hard and tried to tell myself I was just seeing things, that it was a shadow or just my imagination. But when I opened my eyes again, I realized I wasn't crazy. The figure was definitely there. I should have cautiously made my way back upstairs and woke up my parents, but instead I did something very stupid. I'm not sure why I did it. I guess some part of me just wanted to try to make out if he was breathing, and I moved closer to the window and practically pressed my face to the glass. That's when the figure either heard me or felt my eyes on him, and his head spun around to face me, not his upper body. Just his head jerking around to look over his shoulder, almost like an animal. In that moment, I saw two pale pinpricks of light staring directly back at me, and I just knew they were his eyes. I launched myself back from the window and screamed for my parents. I practically flew up the stairs and started wailing that there was a man on the front porch. My parents don't believe in guns. So when my dad saw the terror on my face, he grabbed the closest heavy object within reach, which happened to be a metal tubing attachment from the vacuum cleaner. He then made his way down the stairs. As I threw myself into my mom's arms, I heard my dad cursing and hollering. Then there was a moment of silence. We heard my dad drop the pipe, and when he called upstairs to my mom, his voice was terrified and desperate. Call the cops. Do it now. Now, my dad is a big guy, 6'4", and at the time, easily 250. And back when I was a baby, he used to work part-time as a bouncer. But in that moment, he sounded frightened in a way I never thought possible. There came a hard pounding from outside the front door. I hid in my parents' closet while my mom called the cops. My dad was halfway up the stairs yelling at the guy just to leave, and that the police were coming. After what felt like 10 minutes, though it was probably closer to 3, the pounding stopped. The police arrived maybe 10 minutes later and searched the entire property and the surrounding houses, but they couldn't find the man. I stayed upstairs while my mom and dad spoke to the officers in the driveway. The police did routine drive-bys for the next several nights, but as far as I know, they never found the man. I didn't get a good night's sleep for weeks. I kept remembering how the man's head had snapped around to face me, 
those pale eyes burning themselves permanently into my mind. It was several weeks later that my dad finally told me what scared him so much. When he had reached the bottom of the stairs, the man had his face pressed up to the window, and the knife was between his teeth. My dad dropped the vacuum pipe when he saw the tip of the knife impaled through the man's cheek. The man had then started tracing his blood against the outside of the window with his finger. After the police had arrived, they noticed streaks of blood all around the siding of our house, as if he had encircled it, continuing to run his bloody fingers across the outer walls. My family never took walks at night again, even after the other houses were eventually occupied. And to this day, I never ever peek out through the curtains at night for fear I may see those eyes again. I used to live in this small, sleepy forest town, which at the time was notorious for being the most boring place to raise a family in the Midwest. That never bothered me very much. I liked the isolation and the privacy, and the knowledge that those late-breaking violent stories you hear on the news would never involve us. I lived about a minute away from a large open field, where I could easily walk for about 15 minutes without ever having to set foot on concrete. One day last summer, I was taking my dog Oscar for a walk across the field pretty early in the morning as I usually did. But today, something happened to catch my eye immediately after I went through the fence. About 15 meters to the left of the entry gate is an old fishing pit that was surrounded by overgrown bushes with barbed wire. So I heard something rustling from the undergrowth, and I stopped to investigate. I noticed the outline of someone standing under the shadows of the trees, staring at me without moving. Completely taken aback and slightly unnerved, I decided to just keep walking my dog as if I hadn't seen anything. I usually play music on my phone, but after that chilling encounter, I had no intention of doing so, just in case that person decided to try and come at me from behind. After walking for another 15 minutes, I completed my loop around the field and was making my way back when I noticed a tall man walking from the grassy area around the fishing pit to the gate. It was hard to tell because of the distance, but I would say he was around 30 years old and well built. I made sure to keep my distance and decided to play fetch with my dog for a while and give him time to leave as my gut feeling was telling me that it wasn't a good idea to approach him. After a short while, I made sure the coast was clear and called my dog back over to me and reattached his leash. As we were making our way out of the field through the gate where we originally entered, Oscar started pulling at his leash and sniffing around the bushes where I had first noticed the silhouette of the man. I tugged at the leash and called my dog's name, but he refused to obey, which was strange because he usually didn't give me any trouble. I walked towards him to grab his collar, nervously scanning the area again for the strange man, when I noticed a piece of blue cloth on the other side of the barbed wire divider that surrounds the fishing pit. I tied my dog to a nearby stump, carefully climbed over the fence, and went to investigate. This next part is very difficult for me to recount, because while a part of me is pleased my actions that day brought light to a violent crime and brought closure, however horrific to someone's family, another part of me wishes I had just been less patient and kept tugging at my dog, because the nightmares have yet to stop. There was a body of a young girl covered in bruises all over her face and lacerations to her wrists. Fresh blood was pooling under the gash in her neck. Her eyes were all puffy like she had been crying for a very long time. I couldn't even begin to imagine what she had been put through. After calling the police, I sat by the gate and waited what was probably only about eight minutes, but it felt like a lifetime. Even though I obviously knew she was dead, when I overheard the ambulance attendant confirm it, I threw up all over the grass. The police tried asking me questions, and I told them what I could recall about the stranger. While my dog whined and tried to nuzzle me while I sat on the grass. A week later, I read in the newspaper that the young girl was a 12-year-old named Megan that had gone missing no more than five minutes away from my house. She had been sexually assaulted before being murdered. 
After three months of continuous searching, nobody matched the vague description of the man I had given the police. More than a few times I've noticed people in my own town giving me sideways glances that feel more like suspicion than pity, and that's almost more than I can bear. Please just remember to keep things in perspective, no matter how shitty a day you're having. However many trivial inconveniences you have to endure, you were at least lucky enough not to have found a dead child while enjoying your daily routine. My thoughts and prayers go out to that poor girl's family. This story is told from the point of view of a female. My husband and I live in Richmond, Virginia. About two weeks ago, we decided that we wanted to get season passes to King's Dominion, which is the biggest amusement park in our state. We were short on cash, and were in between paychecks, so we decided to sell some of our old things on a mobile app called Let Go, which is basically like Craigslist where you can post items you have for sale, and it shows it to everyone within a 50 mile radius of your location. The only way Let Go is different from Craigslist is that you actually have to make an account, but no personal information is required besides your name and your general area of residence. You were also able to chat with other buyers and sellers through the messaging system on the app to keep your phone numbers anonymous. I posted my old tablet on Let Go to make up for the money we still needed to get the passes, and within a few minutes I got a message from a woman named Keisha, who was interested in making an offer. The conversation went as follows. Hi, is the tablet still available? Yes, it is. Great. Can I pick it up in two hours when I get off? Actually, I'm trying to get some King's Dominion passes today, so I can go this evening. I could drop it off to you if that's okay. Yeah, that works. I work at the McDonald's off Nine Mile Road. Okay, great. Can you send me the address so I can head over? Now, the conversation stopped there for a bit. After I had asked Keisha for the address to her McDonald's, she didn't respond for a while. And looking back after everything happened, it should have been a red flag. But at the time, I figured she was slow to reply because she was working. I asked my husband if he knew which McDonald's it could be, and he looked it up on Google Earth. I copied the address and messaged her back asking if it was the right address, and she responded, Yeah, that's it. Message me when you're here, so I can tell my manager I need to run out to my car. After that, my husband and I grabbed a tablet and began the drive. We had to take the highway at rush hour, so what should have been a 20-minute drive ended up being around 40 minutes. As we were stuck in traffic, Keisha would send me several messages asking me where we were, and each time I would reply the same way, telling her that we were on our way but we were caught up in traffic. We finally arrived and parked in front of the main entrance. My husband suggested that we sit on the bed of his truck because he didn't want to make Keisha walk up to the window of a stranger's car. I agreed, and I hopped out of his truck, and he pulled down the hitch door to his bed, and we took a seat. I pulled out my phone and messaged her saying that we were there. We waited for about five minutes staring at the door, but the only person who came was a man on a cell phone who got into a car that was next to ours and drove off. After another few minutes, my husband and I were tired of waiting, so I checked my phone to see if I had any new messages. I looked up our conversation and discovered that Keisha had blocked me. I showed my husband and he got pissed. He told me to wait in the truck with the doors locked while he went inside and asked the manager if anybody named Keisha worked there. He took my phone with him to use as evidence of our conversation. When he came back to the truck a few minutes later, he told me that the manager said there was a girl named Keisha that worked there, but she had been sent home early because of slow customer traffic. It was in that moment that I put two and two together. The only person we saw come out of the restaurant was the man who was on the phone, who quickly got in his car next to ours and drove off. I never said anything about my husband being with me. For all they knew, I was by myself. We peeled out of the parking lot and sped back home. On our way back, I deleted the application from my phone. I know this sounds like a lot of speculation, but I'm fairly certain that I was almost the victim of a kidnapping, because there have been several cases of women in Richmond and other areas of Virginia who have used the Let Go app. 
and have gone missing or have been robbed at gunpoint. I'm grateful that my husband came along with me, because if he didn't, there's a good chance I wouldn't be able to share this story. Keep this story in mind for the future, and as always, make sure to bring somebody with you when meeting with a stranger. My name is Stephanie. I'm 18, but this happened in the summer of 2014. One night my friends and I decided to go to the park that was by our apartment building just to drink and be rebellious teenagers. We were all having a good time drinking and smoking marijuana when one of our friends suggested that we should go skinny dipping. It sounded like fun. As everyone was getting undressed, I happened to notice this putrid smell coming from the bushes by the water. I brought it up to my friends and before long, we were all searching for where the stench was coming from. After a few minutes, we found this large old green suitcase sticking out of the water among the weeds. It was locked with one of those three-digit code mechanisms. We all freaked out and got dressed and headed back to our apartments. I volunteered to make an anonymous call to the cops since we were all underage and drinking. None of us wanted to wait down by the lake for them to show up. I watched from my bedroom window as, in the distance, what was only at first a few cop cars down by the lake steadily grew until there were more than ten. The next day on the news, they reported on finding a mutilated body of a young woman stuffed into the suitcase. I immediately felt sick. The crazy thing was that about two weeks prior, I thought I heard a woman screaming down by the park, and I had my parents call the cops, but they never found anything. My friends and I never go down to the park after dark anymore. All I can think about when I look at that lake is the horrific rotting meat smell that led us to the suitcase and the horrible sensation I felt when I poked at it with a stick. I'm probably just imagining it, but at the time, I seemed to remember hearing a moan coming from within. My story takes place in Lancaster, California back in 2007. I was 18 at the time and a senior in high school. I had picked up a job as a sign waver. You know, those people who stand outside on street corners waving promotional signs for businesses. Yeah, it sucks about as much as you think it does, but as a high school student it paid fairly well. By the way, please stop throwing things at us from your cars while we're waving our signs. It's just not cool. The job is demeaning enough without having fast food launched at our heads. Anyway, I had been standing on my corner for about two hours swinging my sign around and waving at passing drivers when I noticed this bald guy sitting across the street from me on a bench looking my way. I waved to him more or less just to keep my rhythm going and he immediately gave me the finger. It wasn't just a casual flip off either. He raised his fist like he wanted to hit me and started shouting at me from across the intersection. I couldn't make out exactly what he was saying but the word faggot was definitely used at least once. I avoided eye contact with him and focused my attention on the cars again. Soon after, my boss pulled up to the curb and told me that I was free to leave as our company got laid off and all the sign waivers were going to be replaced by a different team. I was disappointed that I would be out of work for the foreseeable future, but in that moment I was relieved to be able to sit down somewhere out of the sun. I was about to tell my boss about the bald guy when I noticed that the bench across the street was empty. I'm not sure when he had left, but I simply shrugged it off and got into the car with my boss, who told me that my replacement was going to be there within an hour. Over the course of the next hour, I went home, got changed, and was meeting a friend for lunch before going to see a movie, when the notifications on my phone started exploding nonstop, with people asking me if I was alright and to please call them. I was confused and immediately called my mom, who started crying when she heard my voice. I went home to be with her and immediately found out what all the concern had been about. The news was reporting that a sign waiver had just been shot dead on the very corner I had been standing on less than an hour ago. When the victim had fallen, his sign had partially covered his face and he hadn't had any identification on him so most of my friends had jumped to the horrible conclusion that it was me lying there. The creepy thing was that the victim and I looked very similar. We were both Latino with short dark hair. We were about the same height, 
and even had been wearing nearly identical outfits. I was eventually interviewed by the police, and I mentioned the bald man who had been shouting angrily at me from across the street. But to the best of my knowledge, they concluded that the shooting was gang-related. Either way, the situation shook me, and I didn't feel safe or relaxed for a long while afterwards. I felt terrible that the other guy died, but at the same time, had my boss not come and picked me up when he did, who knows if it would have been me who was shot and killed. I have a wife and child now, and sometimes when I look at them, I think about how different everything could have been. This story is not my own, but my mother's. My parents were living in a small apartment complex in Arizona while my mom was pregnant with me. The apartment was pretty much microscopic, with a very tiny kitchen, a small living room, and an even smaller bathroom. It was October of 2001, and my mom was about seven months pregnant with me. She was at home while my dad was working, when she had gone down to the lobby to get the mail. When she got back to the apartment, she sat down and started watching TV. She began to hear deep breathing from behind her. Not even the careful type of breathing of someone trying not to be heard. She walked over to the closet by the door and discovered that there was a man hiding in it. She recognized the man immediately as the guy who lived on the floor above them. She started screaming at him to get out while he babbled something incoherently about not turning on the news or drawing attention to the room. My mom told me the next few seconds were a blur and she couldn't remember the specific details, but she grabbed her phone and called my dad, knowing he would get there quicker than the cops would. She put the phone on speaker and my dad started screaming at the neighbor, threatening his life, saying that he was only five minutes away. Well, that was enough to scare the intruder into leaving, but instead of exiting out the door, he climbed out the window and went down the fire escape. After my dad arrived home, my parents called the police. When the police showed up, they explained to my parents that the guy was a drug addict and he had gotten into trouble with some dangerous men who apparently threatened to come to his apartment to kill him. The man most likely panicked and ducked into the first apartment he found that was unlocked. Fast forward a week. During this time, my dad had been keeping an eye out for the guy all over town and in the complex. When he happened to spot him late one night in the parking lot, when the man saw him coming, he immediately started apologizing for breaking into their apartment, using the excuse that there was a couple of people trying to kill him. But my dad grabbed him and slammed him into the wall. The guy grabbed a crowbar from the back of his car to defend himself, and my dad got his gun from his car and called the cops. When the cops arrived, they explained that they could arrest the guy for breaking and entering, but that he could also press charges on dad for assaulting him. Of course, my dad couldn't afford to go to jail since he was supporting my mom, so he had to give the guy a pass. Luckily, the guy moved away a few days later. Looking back, my mom says they were very fortunate as there was no telling what could have happened. If the people that were trying to kill our neighbor found him in our apartment, with my mom still in there. <laughs>